like to give you all a warm welcome this morning and particularly uh, we have two visitors this morning. They've been here before but um, uh, Bill and Eleanor we do give you a warm welcome and we do pray that uh, you'll receive a blessing from the service this morning. And uh, I don't think there's anything else. So just uh, if you take notice of the uh, uh, what's happening during the week, uh, uh, we didn't announce it uh, last week, I don't think, but uh, last Friday was um, uh, the 66th wedding anniversary of um, Will and Joan. Uh, they're unable to be with us today because of Joan's health, but uh, we, uh, we give them our uh, warmest greetings. And also during the week there's uh, one of our young ladies, to wit, our organist, is having a birthday <laughs> and, and uh, she'll admit to 21, so uh, we, uh, we wish you many happy returns of the day, uh, Berenice. <laughs> So, uh, also after the service this morning, the uh, the streaming will stop uh, at the end of the uh, uh, Graham's uh, sermon, and then the uh, we'll uh, have the communion service uh, afterwards. The uh, next Wednesday will be the um, uh, uh, our shop, shall we say the sweet hour of prayer where we'll gather at 1.30 on Wednesday for the weekly prayer meeting. And uh, next Sunday at 11 o'clock, uh, Graham will be um, uh, commencing a series on uh, uh, for Lent and um, also after that service will be the uh, five-year visitation of Presbytery uh, to come to see us. Uh, prior to the service, I believe they'll be meeting with the, the Board of Management and the session and the Minister, and then after the service, they would like to uh, meet the congregation uh, uh, afterwards. So that would be uh, next Sunday. And in the meantime, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Keith. It's lovely to be with you this morning. We're going to begin by singing together God's praise from uh, hymn 261, Christ, whose glory fills the skies, Christ, the true, the only light. <coughs>
unite our hearts in prayer. Let us come before God with prayer. Lord, you have heard our praise, and we come with this prayer that you who art divine and radiant would fill us. Fill me, radiancy divine, wrote Charles Wesley, and this is what we love and long for. We come before you as flawed individuals, and we have no righteousness of our own. But we come before you seeking your mercy and your favor, and that you would gather us as your children in this service. And especially as we uh, take together at the end the symbols of your broken body and your shed blood, Lord Jesus, that we might know by faith that you are feeding us and you are making us in your own image. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would gather us with Christians around the world, wherever your name is exalted, wherever Jesus is worshipped and adored. We might be at one with that great chorus of praise that ascends to you today, across our suburb, across our country, and around the world in languages which we have never heard of. May Christ be praised. So be with us in this time together. For his namesake. Amen. Christine is going to bring to us Young at Heart. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. Two weeks ago, one of our granddaughters was given a school project, and it was to choose a significant character in Australian history and write about the character. Now, to my surprise, when we heard about it, um, this is a co-ed school, a little Catholic school actually, of the characters, and I don't know how many there were, one was a woman and one only. So Gemma chose the woman. And the woman's name was Vida Goldstein. Now, the name meant something to me. I hadn't really looked into her, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to look into her. Gemma discovered that the Vida was a student at PLC, where I taught for 21 years, and where her mother and two aunts were students in the senior school. I knew this about Vida, but not, not much more, nor did my daughters, which it says something. I think now PLC does a lot more to inform its students about past students. Anyway, I'm not telling you about Vida Goldstein other than her name, but I want to tell you about another school project which had a lot of significance. In 1999, in Kansas, in America, a high school teacher, teacher called Norm Connard, don't think his name is famous for other things, anyway, he encouraged three of his students, Megan Stewart, Elizabeth Combers, and Sabrina Coons, he encouraged them to work for a year on a National History Day project. So this was not going to be, you know, a quick project that you finish over dinner and present the next day. These girls found a short, or were given, I think, a short news clipping about this lady called Irene Sendler. The girls spent a year investigating her life and they ultimately wrote a play entitled Life in a Jar. I haven't heard about it. I don't know whether it's been performed here. The play ignited interest in Sendler's story. So she wasn't unknown, but she wasn't widely known. And it's been performed hundreds of times across North America, the US and Canada, and in Poland. And the story has been written up in this book called 
Life in a Jar, the Irina Sendler project, but there's also, I think this is the film, The Jars of Hope, and just pay attention and you'll find out why jars are important. So she was born in 1910 near Warsaw, and she's, she was a Roman Catholic Christian, and she began helping Jews as early as 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. At first, she helped create false documents for over 3,000 Jewish families. Later, she joined the Zagota, which was the resistance, the Polish resistance organization, which helped Jewish Polish Jews, Jewish Poles. In 1943, she became head of their children's division. And for some reason, because she actually worked, her official job of which the Nazis knew was that she worked in the social welfare department. And so she had special access to the ghetto in Warsaw to conduct, for example, inspections for typhus and she used this her day job to set up a smuggling operation not smuggling drugs but smuggling babies she and her colleagues began secretly transporting babies and children out of the ghetto by hiding them in an ambulance with a false bottom, or in baskets, or in coffins, and even in potato sacks. They had all sorts of fascinating tricks, and I didn't have time to follow up more of these, but somebody who was, had a toolbox because they went in to do maintenance work had a false bottom in the toolbox where a very young baby could be hidden. And if that was, if young babies were being, or babies were being transported, they managed to have a barking dog with them. So that if the baby started to cry, the dog barked and the Nazis couldn't hear the cry. Once the children were out of the ghetto, Sendler arranged for them to be given false identities and placed them with Polish families, so Polish non-Jewish families, or in orphanages. However, she never gave up hope that after the war, the children might find their families and resume their Jewish identities. In hopes of that, she kept meticulous lists of each child's name. In the wrong hands, these documents would have been fatal. She would have been killed. And not only she, but all those who worked with her. To protect the children, and in the hope of a better future, she sealed these lists of names in jars and buried them. Only she knew where the information lay, waiting for the day that she could dig them up. She rescued two, two and a half thousand children this way and was, of course, eventually captured. She was tortured and sentenced to death. But, and there's two stories, the story I read was that she was able to bribe the guards um, Graham read that it was her friends, whatever. They knew how to get round the Gestapo and she was smuggled to safety. She still kept working under a false name. Anyway, after the war ended, she and her colleagues dug up the jars and with the names, but most of the parents had been killed either in the Treblinka in extermination camp or they were listed as missing. Now, in 1965, she was ordered, honoured by Jews 
the Yad Vashem, which is a Jewish organization which follows up the many Gentiles who helped Jews. So she was honored as one of the righteous among the nations, but she wasn't widely known until this school project. She was so she was a Catholic, a nurse, and a social worker who defied the Nazis at a great <coughs> personal risk and nearly paid the ultimate price. But she lived, I think, to be what you heard you sing her this morning. Oh seven. Oh seven. So she was ninety seven. Um her story is one of tremendous moral fortitude and her determination to fight evil. So I think there's two aspects to her story. I think her courage and wisdom inspires us all to do whatever we can to resist evil, using opportunities that come our way in our everyday lives. And they do come our way. At the same time, coming back to the school project, her story is a reminder that by doing thorough research for such a project, untold good may come of it. So I want to leave you with the words of the writer of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 10. When in the old version, which I learned as a child, what Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Or, as a modern translation put it, whatever the activity in which you engage, do it with all your ability. May God continue to bless the work of the Irene Sendlers of this world. <coughs> Thank you, Christine, and what a courageous woman that was. Um, Amanda is going to bring us our Bible reading this morning. Thank you, Amanda. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible today, and it's Corinthians chapter 1, ch Chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I, all, what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be unanswerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body 
eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, I will give instructions when I come. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, your offering will now be received. We bring our gifts, Heavenly Father, and we ourselves would uh, serve you and so receive not only what we bring, but ourselves also for the work that you wish to do in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Well, the, uh, the next hymn is Jesus, Lover of My Soul. It's the second Wesley hymn. So uh, is it going to be a trifecta to Charles Wesley this morning? Well, you'll have to wait and see. Jesus, Lover of My Soul, uh, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is nigh. Hymn 414.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I used this image. I'm not sure it's terribly clear at the back of the church on the definition I've given, but it's the one that's on the front of the leaflet today. And it's the last in a series. Uh, We've come to number seven. Uh, Looking at this word, alelon. It's a Greek word, and it's translated into English by two words, one another. So this is our seventh study in the expression one another in the New Testament. And uh, as we come to it, uh, I've used the image because um, some of you might have done the walk from uh, the saddle. What's the saddle called at Wilson's Promontory? Some of you. Yeah, Oberon Saddle down to Sealer's Cove. And this is that road, uh, that path. And if you're on that path with small children or larger children, or especially with smaller and larger children, some run on ahead and some are straggling behind and you want to keep together. So I uh, have to keep close to one another. So I, I thought that was quite a nice image. So here we are, we're thinking about one another, and there are two things I want to think about today. So you're going to have to keep tuned in, all right? Two things. The expression, uh, wait for one another, occurred in the reading that Amanda brought to us, wait for one another. And that's a very important uh, idea that I want to try and open up a little bit. But the other one is salute one another or greet one another. Now, the, uh, the greet one another reading uh, occurs in four places. And it says this. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss or a brotherly kiss. So it's, you might think, well, hmm, what's the Bible got to say about COVID and greeting one another and especially in the era of elbow bumps and so on. Well, well, we'll get to that as well. But I have four headings that I want to share with you, and they're pretty simple this morning. Firstly, I want to think about the Word. And then I want to think about the sacrament, which we will be sharing shortly, inviting you to participate in. And then I want to think about the wait, that is waiting for one another. And then I want to think about the salute, the greeting. Of course, not formal, but how do we greet one another? Of course, in military organizations and other uniformed organizations, they have a formality to it. We've actually seen what used to be the Scouts' three-fingered salute in Myanmar recently because it's a symbol of protest against the military junta that has taken over the country. Uh, So there are different ways of saluting and identifying. We'll think a little bit about that too. So first of all, I want to think about the word. A word is very important to us. Uh, We talk about the Bible as the word of God. The Bible is words. It's a message. Jesus had a Bible. He had a handwritten Bible because printing hadn't been invented. He had the Old Testament. He possibly had it in two languages because it was there in Hebrew, but it was also translated into Greek 200 years before Jesus was born. So the Old Testament, the same books that you have in your Protestant Old Testament, were there in Greek in Jesus' day, as well as in Hebrew. And he knew it, and he quoted it many times. And he taught his disciples about it. But it's interesting when we think about words. I've been reading a book recently that's quite popular at the moment. It's one of uh, books I got for Christmas. It's called The Dictionary of Lost Words. And it's about the making of the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, I've got the shorter Oxford at home. I think it's yours, Christine. Two volumes, each one about this thick. So they take up eight inches of shelf space. on our, And this is... The shorter dictionary. The longer dictionary is about 10 or 12 volumes. So how was this dictionary made? Well, it was made by people being invited to send in the use of words. And and the uh, dictionary lexicographers, under the guidance of an esteemed and renowned Scottish lexicographer, I may say, 
in the city of Oxford in England sat at a table in a tin shed in the backyard of somebody's house, eloquently named the Scriptorium, and from all over the English world they were sent words. On a, they had to say what size the cards had to be and they put them in pigeonholes. This word has this meaning if you look at something William Shakespeare said or something that somebody else said way gone by. And this process started in the late 1880s and it went on and it went on and it was slowed down and it was a slow process. But in 1901 it was discovered that the word bond made wasn't in the dictionary. And uh, of course the dictionary was still in process but they'd got way beyond the letter B and it was coming out in sort of slender volumes for some of the letters. And the question was, why was it not there? Well, it wasn't there because the men who were doing the sorting of the words were getting answers from people who were reading books written by men and it was a male vocabulary that was shaping up. And a girl in the story uh, named Esme, she discovers that the words that women often use, the words of the marketplace, the street words, are not used, they're not acceptable in the dictionary because they haven't been dignified with a place in the literature or because they're a bit vulgar or they're street words. Now here's the thing. The New Testament of our Bibles wasn't written in classical Greek. People thought it was a kind of Hebrew Greek because it's they knew it was different from classical Greek. The Greek of the classicists, the plays and the, and the other great uh, Greek minds were, had a lofty tone to it, but not the Greek of the New Testament. About 1908, they discovered that the Greek of the New Testament is street-level Greek. It's the Greek of the ordinary man. They were discovering, and the ordinary woman I may say as well, they were discovering uh, receipts and things on clay clay bits of clay tablet what happened when a pot was broken the shards of it could be used to to scratch on and to write messages on it was a lot cheaper uh, because in the ancient world a sheet of papyrus let me tell you would you like to hold that up to see that ipad i don't know if you can see the ipad here a sheet of papyrus in the ancient world cost about the same as an ipad today you got that so a sheet of papyrus was very expensive and to write uh, a gospel, say the gospel of Mark, which is a long gospel of 28 chapters, it, it would be a, require a scroll about 30 feet long, or 28 feet long, I think they said. So here is an expensive document. And when the first message of Christ was to be spread, the church didn't say, well, we have to raise some funds and write it all down. No, they didn't say that. They said, let's get to the marketplace and tell people. Let's get to the synagogue and show them how the Old Testament speaks about the Messiah. They went to the, wherever they could find people gathering and they shared the message. And then churches began to form, little communities of Christians. And then they needed help. And so they had letters written to them. And you heard this morning a part of that letter to the church in Corinth, a Greek church, read by Amanda. And things weren't going hunky-dory there. There were problems. Hunky-dory. Would that word be in the Oxford English Dictionary? We have to check because it may not be there in, in our literature. So here was this idea of the common words. We need to remember that the words themselves are just vibrations in the air. If I'm not speaking, the air's not vibrating on your eardrums. We heard about the cochlear implants recently. Right? Or there may just be ink on a page. That's words. Or it may be pixels on a screen. But these things are symbols of something that is real. Right? They speak to us. They're not the reality. They're just a symbol or a kind of metaphor that tells us. So, for example, in the Dictionary of Lost Words, eventually uh, a boyfriend, a young man who's a friend of Esme, catches on to this idea, and he's working in a print shop. 
and the print, all the young men who are apprentice printers have gone because it's 1914 and the First World War has started. And only old men, men who used to be printers have come back, men whose eyes are no longer quite up to it, or younger boys who need to be taught the skills, 12s and 13-year-olds. And they're starting to work in the print shop because all the 15 and 16-year-olds have gone and enlisted. And so Gareth comes and he says, I've got a new word for you, Esme. And on a slip of paper, he has the word loss. And he's got a quotation from one of the mothers of the apprentices who'd signed up with the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Regiment. She'd come in that morning to tell the boss that her boys wouldn't be coming back. They were both killed at the Battle of Ypres. One of them was nearly 17. He would have been 17 next week, she said. And she, made, and she talked about the loss. She talked about the loss, her loss as a mother and the loss of possibly being a grandmother. And she ended up by saying, I think if I'm, not, I'm going to lose my mind. And so there was a new intensity to the word loss that hadn't quite been there before. But during that period was there every day on the front page of the new newspapers. Lost. The lists of the lost. So you see, what you feel, the reality you feel when you think about the event is created by the words, but the reality was what that mother knew. That sense of desolation. I'm going to lose my mind. So God's message to us comes as words. And the Bible says it pleased God, indeed it's in 1 Corinthians, that same letter, it's pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. So there's a message coming with power, if we will but hear it. And that creative power, the New Testament tells us, was what created the worlds, the word of God. And John tells us, created redemption as well. In him we have redemption. The one who was the word that became flesh. So the Christian message is good news because it enables us to encounter our, another reality. And that reality is Jesus. So that's the first thing. The word is about Jesus. The word is not Jesus, but Jesus is the word made flesh for us. And the second thing that I want to talk about is the sacrament. The sacrament of bread and wine. Before, before he died, Jesus gave us this sacrament. After the resurrection, he gave us another sacrament, baptism. Go into all the world and make disciples. So either side of his death, he gave us a sign using physical symbols to stimulate our sense of what is real. Now, the physical things then are the bread and wine, which we will be sharing today, and the water of baptism, which we share when somebody comes newly into the church. The Bible crafts words into many forms to help us get the message. There are many long lists in the Bible, genealogies, there are timeless tales, there are gripping narrative, there's sublime poetry, there's songs of love and hate, and detailed letters, and encoded conflict. And all of this helps us to understand the words uh, that they reach into our lives, like that word loss can do and speak to us. But Jesus didn't leave it only to the words. Jesus wants to nourish his disciples in their life of faith by creating himself in them. He is our nourishment. In John's Gospel he talks and says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you won't have life in you. It's like when... It, and later on in that gospel, he comes to wash Peter's feet. And Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And then Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have nothing to do with me. Well, then wash all of me, he says. And Jesus said, well, that won't be necessary. The feet is representative of, of all that I'm doing. And so it is, his body broken and his blood shed nourish us. We learn of his dying love as we come to the Last Supper. Now what, what then about the weight? Well, 
you, you remember in the reading from Amanda, it was, when you come together, wait for one another. There seems to have been a problem, and the problem in Corinth was this, that they used to meet for a fellowship meal. Now, pre-COVID, we had fellowship meals here. We had a meal together after church uh, periodically, and we had monthly uh, uh, fellowship luncheons. So we know about fellowship meals, but we, it seems that these were called love feasts in the early church, and the, uh, there's a mention of them, for example, in the letter to Jude, tiny letter, one chapter, verse 12 says, some deeply critical things about people who come in and mess up your love feasts. In fact, it's a, a very powerful use of words to describe something that's de terribly destructive. Uh, the love feasts were destructive. And also this week I, I took off the shelves the writings of the younger Pliny, which you get in pen and paperback these days. And Pliny was writing in about the year 114. And he was writing his letters to the emperor who was Trajan. And in volume 10, letter 96, he says that uh, he has discovered that the Christians that he tortured confessed to meeting for a meal. But they don't do that anymore because the emperor has forbidden it. You see, they were meeting together to square their allegiance to Jesus. And that was seditious. They were only supposed to swear allegiance to Caesar. So now Pliny explains that he's, he gives people three chances to recant, and if they don't, he has them executed. He has them led away to be executed. But the deaconesses that he tortured, they've, they've, real, they've said, no, we don't do that anymore because it's seditious. So there's an interesting comment on something we don't know a lot about, the love feasts. But beyond the love feasts, there is... What happened on this first, uh, uh, this last, <laughs> how am I to say it? The last Passover of Jesus' life. And what was this about? Well, Jesus didn't want the divisions that people could bring to the love feast to be perpetuated in the church. You see, it was working out that the rich people came early. They set up. They had plenty of time. The slaves in the Christian community, they only got when they knocked off at whatever time slaves get to knock off. If you read the uh, Dictionary of Lost Words, you'll find that the bondmaid in the story didn't get off till the rest of the household were in bed. So she had to work pretty late. So I imagine it might have been a bit like that in the Roman Empire. The story in, in uh, Pliny's letter says they met before dawn. They met before dawn. That was when they were able to gather. But the wealthy could provide food for themselves and drink for themselves, and they would get drunk and they would enjoy their, you know, their having a good time together as uh, followers of this new faith that was spreading around the world. And others would come in and they would be uh, regarded as less important and less significant. And the, so the slaves had, didn't have the financial means and they were humiliated on account of their meager resources. It wasn't just bad manners. We would say bad manners, yes. But Paul says in this chapter that it's deadly. It's going to kill the church. And he's saying it's having a devastating effect on you right now. For this reason, some of you are sick and ill. God is bringing judgment among you because of the inequities that you're perpetuating as those who should know better. And the apostle gives guidelines to them. And the guideline is quite simple. He said, so then, brothers and sisters, when you gather together to share the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. Wait for one another. And so we wait and we gather. And we try and share the supper in as equitable a way as we can. We haven't insisted that we wait and drink at exactly the same moment. Uh, I grew up in a church where we passed around a common cup. It's no longer a common practice. And, uh, and we took the turn at, a turn at drinking and then passed it to the person next to us. And so, but here we have individual glasses and today we're going to try and share it in, a, not only try, we are sharing it in a COVID safe manner. Uh, I can even see latex gloves on the communion table and a mask. That's never been there before. So we're, we're bringing it to you uh, so that you may remember this Passover. 
Christ is our Passover. In chapter uh, 10 of this same letter to the Corinthians, Paul says Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. It is Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That echoes through all the stories of the Old Testament, the sacrificial Lamb. And that person is Jesus. And he has paid a price for us. And we come to him as the Savior. The wine is the, uh, represents the body, the blood of Christ and the broken bread, his broken body. Words remain necessary. If you read the story of this Passover, this last meal, this last supper of Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, he tells us that when they had hymned a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. What hymns did they hymn at Passover? Well, we know that they sang Psalms 116, 17 and 18 at the close of the Passover. If you want to know what Jesus was thinking that night, you should read Psalm 116, 117, and 118, because those thoughts went through his head. I shall not die but live. O set ye open unto me the gates of righteousness. I will take the cup of salvation. Great verses that should be sung at, at communion time or at least passed through our heads. So words are necessary, songs are necessary. The narrative is necessary, the narrative of the Passover story. And this will all help when it comes together with the tangible symbols, the bread and the wine, which are as physical as you are and as I am. And, and uh, it reminds us then of the uh, reality. It's not just an idle tale, as Peter tells us elsewhere. So the fourth thing I want to think about uh, quickly is the salute. I noticed, I don't know if you watched the news this week, but when President Sarkozy was up for sentencing because of uh, his uh, offences against the law, and when he arrived to, at the court, the police outside saluted him. But the journalist said when he came out, having been sentenced to, I think, a further year of detention or something like that, they didn't salute him at all. See, he'd gone down in their estimation. He was now a sentenced criminal. You don't salute a sentenced criminal. So the salute is a mark of respect. Now, the salute that we're talking about is not a formal militaristic thing. It's a greeting. It's g'day. So pleased to see you. you know, it's, a, it's an openness to the other person. And we need that. And what Paul says... And I've already mentioned, he says it in Romans 16, 16, and in the last chapters of the first letter and second letter to the Corinthians. And Peter says the same thing in his first epistle. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet one another with a kiss. So this is a cultural sign, you might think. Let me give you an example. I was going to say that the men probably kissed the men and the women kissed the women. Um, but I've discovered that uh, in Ethiopia today, uh, in the uh, Christian community, uh, men and women greet each other with an embrace. They bring their heads close to each other. A little bit like the French do, except the French usually kiss once, twice, three times. I remember I wasn't quite sure whether it was to be three times or two times when I went to France. So there is a, 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 sense of, a different sense about physical proximity. So in Ethiopia... Christians uh, shake, uh, give each other an embrace and, and uh, put the cheek to cheek. The, this, to what extent then is this a cultural sign? Well, I, I checked up J.B. Phillips' translation, and I like J.B. Phillips, and he translates it, greet each other with a hearty handshake. Now, J.B. Phillips isn't Ethiopian, of course. He's English. So uh, is that a legitimate translation of a holy kiss? You can form your own opinion. I think we've all had to think again about how we greet one another through COVID. And we've seen our Prime Minister bumping elbows, right or left elbow, it doesn't seem to matter which, uh, with people all over the place. And we've been wearing masks and uh, we've been avoiding physical contact. But it's hard, especially with the people you're closest to and you love the most. It's hardest with grandchildren, perhaps. Right? So you, you have to work out 
What is it safe to do? What should we do? And we've worked out innovative ways of greeting one another. But the point here is that this openness to each other is because we belong together as God's family. Hierarchies dissolve when we come to the Lord's table. As we wait for each other and as we greet each other, this should be obvious. And it's our prayer today that as we come to uh, offer the bread and the wine, that you will have a deep sense that you are welcome at this table. The Lord's body was broken and his blood was shed so that your sins could be forgiven and mine. I was talking to a man on Friday night. I got on well with him. But towards the end of the evening we were talking about Christian things. And he said that he thinks it all amounts to being nice. That's what Christianity is about. That's what it's about, isn't it? Being nice to people. And I said, well, what's the significance of the death of Jesus in this? And he couldn't see any significance to the death of Jesus. But he knew for some reason it was important in the Christian church. The answer is that we might imagine we could be the nice people we would like to be. But Jesus invites us to follow him, to carry our cross. He has died that we might be forgiven. But we need to be changed. We need the power of his spirit in our lives. We need to make adjustments day by day. We need, as the Gospels tell us, to take up our cross daily and follow him. And so I invite you to carry out this enterprise in your life this week, to be a disciple of Jesus, to put your feet where his feet would take you and know his presence. And so as we wait for each other and as we greet one another, may we enjoy his fellowship. I'm now going to lead in prayer. I'd like to uh, mention uh, one or two people in prayer today that I have not been doing except allowing us quiet times for prayer. But I'm going to mention uh, one or two people in prayer uh, just by one name. So I invite you to uh, bow your heads and unite with me as we pray together. Lord our God, we come to you. We come with our words, but we also bow with unspoken longings and hidden fears. We come just as we are, our very selves, our lives, our everything. We come humbly to worship and adore you, our Heavenly Father. We ask that flawed and sinful as we are, you will draw near to us, for we come in the name of our Saviour, our Lord, and our brother, Jesus, your own beloved one. Thank you that in him and through his cross, the deceit and corruption of the world is exposed and your truth and light are revealed. We lament our participation in injustice and sin. We have done things which we ought not to have done. And those things which we ought to have done, we have left undone. Please forgive us. Nourish us again as we trust in and are nourished by our Saviour. Help us to listen to one another and to love and respect all your children. Make us wise in the use of words. Enable us to speak graciously, lovingly and truly. Remind us daily that the last in line, the least important, and the lost matter exceedingly to you. In them, each day, you come to us, that each day we may learn to serve you. Grant your Holy Spirit to strengthen us for the good works you have prepared for us. We thank you for the massive difference the UK vaccination program has made with regard to the rates of COVID infections. As the vaccine rollout here flickers into life, we pray local production of the AstraZeneca vaccine will achieve the desired targets, and especially the vulnerable will be kept safe. 
as our Parliament struggles to work out how men and women should relate to one another. Help them to think clearly and avoid the drugs that cloud the mind and distort behaviour. Grant that mutual respect will prevail, irrespective of gender, race or creed. At this time of vulnerability in the Western democracies, help us not to be negligent or to undervalue the freedoms bequeathed to us. Make us patient to listen and to understand contrary views and to give thoughtful and honest expression to the things we believe. This week we pray for India, this largest democracy, that the BJP government will support justice rather than Hindu nationalism, and that those who commit crimes will be held accountable. We ask especially that the Dalit caste, and especially the women who are the most vulnerable in this group of three million, three hundred million people, that these people will be treated humanely. Strengthen the cause of Christian people in whatever language they worship today. Save them from oppression and be their defender. We pray for friends and neighbours who suffer from the infirmity of advancing years or illness, of disease, of body or mind. We lift them to you. We're conscious of Joan's absence and we pray for her and Will. We've been asked to mention Lucy in particular and we pray for her recovery that it might proceed. We pray for Ogilvy, who sends greetings, but is unable to be with us. There are others too, Lord, and we want to name them in the quietness of our hearts. So, Lord, we pray that absent loved ones will nevertheless share your company this morning. And our requests we bring in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray and to say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of approach to the Lord's table is usually 323, and I haven't departed from that today. So we're just seeing the first three verses. They'll be on the screen. And as uh, uh, we sing this hymn, I'll cut the live transmission so that none of us trip over the equipment that are being used to live stream our service. So we say uh, goodbye to those of you who are watching online and some of you have said you would be and uh, join together to sing this great hymn, Here, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. <laughs> 